Hopkinton. My name is Tara Sanda with eHop, and this is Know Your Vote 2020 Social Distancing Edition. Uh, this is the first in a four-part series where we will be meeting with town officials to discuss the articles to be voted on at town meeting, which will be held this year on a Saturday, September 12th. Joining us today via Zoom are Connor Deegan, our town clerk, and Tom Garabedian, our town moderator and host of annual town meeting. Thank you both for taking the time out of your busy schedule to meet with us. Uh, without further ado, I think I would like to just jump right in and start with you, Connor, if that's okay. Go for it. All right, so what I'd like you to do at first is just take us through town meeting and what it's gonna look like. So how do we show up, where do we park? Um, and then like what is, you know, there's gonna be a tent this year outside, so tell us where that's gonna be. And then after that, if you could take us through the check-in process. So it's my understanding that the process will be the same, however, it's gonna look very different. So if you could share with us what you have planned. Of course. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a tent over where the bus loop was in front of the high school, right next to the middle school. So parking is going to be over where teachers and students typically park in front of the high school and over by the HCA. Uh, when people can go and find a spot there, they'll be able to come over towards the bus loop from the side by that center sidewalk there. And there will be check-in tables where we'll have our election staff that would usually be there for your check-in. When you come up, it will be very similar, almost exactly the same as town meeting. The only difference really being that there's going to be a plexiglass shield and we're all going to be wearing masks. Um, it's going to use the same system that we used for the last few town meetings with, uh, with our pull pads to have a little bit quicker of check-in so we can get people in and seated. Uh, but once you get in, we're going to try to aim for having each row filled before we actually get off and have let people kind of just sit wherever. All of the seating will be six feet apart per the Board of Health and the Fire Department. So we will not be allowed to move chairs. Uh, even if we're in the same household, we won't necessarily be able to sit together. We're all gonna have to kind of just go through it and work on just trying to get through it quickly and be able to get out of there for that. Uh, but that's really gonna be the only change with your usual checking of going over to the, the water tower parking lot and coming into the auditorium. Instead, you're just gonna go over, park there and We'll have plenty of signage. There'll be, everything will be kind of easy to see where you need to go from there. Okay, so now if somebody shows up to town meeting without a mask, will they not be allowed in? If somebody shows up to town meeting without a mask, we will try to make reasonable accommodations. Um, we're still working with the health director to figure out what those reasonable accommodations are. But, okay. uh, but that would be a good question for Sean most likely to figure out what how we're going to be able to accommodate. Okay. Um, and you will have, um, will you have masks available if people forget them? Yes. Just okay. like we did at the, at the polls, we have masks ready for anyone who might have forgotten. It's so easy to just even forget it in your car. Yes. And if you even forget it in your car, it's like, you're already right here. You're already checking in. Just here, take this paper mask. You're good to go. Great. And I have to say that town election went great yesterday. So thank you very much for that. Happy to do it. <laughs> um, okay, so there will be uh, more handicap parking available at the high school? So yes, yeah, so Tom had brought that up and we worked uh, with Lieutenant Porter to come up with a solution to increase some of the parking that's typically for visitors right by the, uh, the, dro the old drop-off loop there. Yes. And so we're going to basically kind of cordon some of those off to be handicap only so that we can try to get some more room for folks there. Okay. Um, and there won't be any temperature checks or anything? Not to my knowledge. Um, okay. I, I don't know if the health department will want to do something like that, but to my knowledge, I don't think there will be. Okay. Uh, I guess one of the most important questions I have today is uh, where are the bathrooms? So we're still working on some of the bathrooms. We're talking with the school department to see if we can use the school facilities. 
Uh, but worst case is we'll end up getting some porta potties that will set up close by to where the where the area is for the tent. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, how many people are you planning to attend town meeting? Are planning for, and are we limited to the number of people we can have at this gathering? So. Uh, I'm always cautious about trying to guess how many people are going to show up at town meeting because that that's rarely worked out well. Uh, it's always either more, far more or far less than I guess. So um, I, I, right now we have room for 200 roughly under the tent. Uh, it'll be first come first serve on, on tent seating and there will be plenty of overflow seating probably for at least another hundred that's already ready to go. After that, we will be able to, at the moderator's discretion, continue to expand to allow for more six foot delineation of, of spacing for people. Um, it'll just be working with our public safety and health officials to make sure that we, uh, we expand it so that there's enough room for everyone. But there is no necessary limitation because it's regarding the right to vote. And okay. every registered voter in the town of Hopkinton has the right to come and make their voice heard at town meeting. Okay. Um, now, the check-in process will start at what time and what time will town meeting start? The check-in process is anticipated to start at roughly 8.30 and per the select for the town meeting is due to start at 9.30. Okay. So that'll give about an hour time to, for people to be able to come in and start checking in. Okay. Uh, Tom, I think the next question is for you. Uh, among the changes of town meeting this year is also the quorum. Can you expand on that and how the select board uh, changed our quorum? The state passed uh, some legislation that allowed communities to reduce their quorum for town meetings uh, in light of the, the pandemic and in light of a concern that it might be difficult to meet quorum requirements given uh, people's concerns about COVID. Um, we recommended and the select board uh, agreed with us <clears throat> that we would reduce our quorum from approximately 117 people to 80 people. And so that will enable us to start town meeting with as few as 80 people, even though we do expect that that more people will be attending. But it provides us with an opportunity to get underway on a timely basis and to, to get the business of, of town meeting uh, conducted in a, in a timely and effective fashion. Okay. Um, now with that, the business of town meeting, there is um, some fanfare at the beginning. Um, I believe it's the, the Boy Scouts usually come or is it the Color Guard or the Boy Scouts? The Boy Scouts. The Boy Scouts. Will we be having that kind of ceremonial part of town meeting? Well, we'll certainly salute the flag. Uh, we're still checking uh, with the various organizations with the Boy Scouts uh, to, to confirm their ability and willingness to participate. Okay. All right, so let's start discussing once uh, town meeting starts, uh, what are the rules that are set in place well, it, it will be uh, usual rules. Obviously, the, the overlay to the entire town meeting is that we want to maintain uh, appropriate social distance so that everyone both feels safe and, and is safe to the greatest extent possible. Uh, with that, I think the, uh, you know, the, the rules at town meeting remain the same. We, we do want people to have the opportunity to be heard and to express their opinions. And so there'll be, uh, as there always is, a time limit on the ability of people to make their points and an opportunity for everyone to speak before an individual has a second opportunity to, uh, to approach a microphone and to, and to speak. That having been said, um, the only difference will be that if I sense that, that there is repetition in the points that various speakers are making, uh, recognizing that we're attempting to conduct this meeting in a shorter period of time and, mm -hmm. and uh, in a morning and early afternoon, I'm gonna be quicker to uh, suggest that the points have been made and, and ask the speakers to move on. 
Okay, so they'll still be allowed to go up to the mic, make their statement, and then one follow-up? Uh, they will be able to go up to the mic after they've spoken. Um, we'll have an opportunity to sanitize the mics so that the next individual who comes up is dealing with an environment that uh, you know, is free of, free of germs and droplets and so on. Uh, they'll have a second bite at the apple, so to speak, only after others have had an opportunity to express their opinions and make their points. Oh, so it won't be an automatic follow-up? Uh, I mean, if it's a, if it's a quick follow-up or clarification, obviously we'll let, uh, we'll let that happen, but uh, we don't want people to monopolize the, the mic and, and uh, really take, take too much time. I'll use my judgment to, uh, to see whether the meeting understands the points that have been made. Of course. Um, now, this question could be for you or could be for Connor. Um, and it's the process of which somebody does go up to the microphone. How are they to, will somebody be there guiding or setting people apart the six feet as they wait in line? Will they be able to take their masks off at the microphone? And then I think you touched upon it quickly. There will be a cleansing of the mics in between speakers. Tom, do you want to start off? Sure, I'll, I'll start. There will be cleansing between speakers, uh, so they'll they'll be using uh, you know an alcohol wipe or something to that effect. But we certainly will ask people, and I'll I'll view this from from the head of the stage or the head of the, head of the meeting, that people not crowd uh, one another, that they maintain if they're going to be speaking, they maintain six feet distance from each person who may be in line. Uh, and, and it, again, we'll, we'll attempt to enforce the social distancing through, um, really through common sense. Right. So will you have, like I know, say at the farmer's market in the lines, they do have lines on the ground of where you can stand when you're waiting in line. Is something like that planned for, or are we gonna kinda trust people? We've talked about having, uh, having that worked in following the tent set up so that we can first see how it all looks and then we can on potentially even on the same day as the setup be able to go through and do delineations with the building department as well as the fire department. Okay. And there will be two mics this year as usual. Um, they'll, they'll be at, well, they'll, certainly there'll be at least one mic. I think we're planning only a single aisle. Uh, correct me okay. if I'm wrong, Connor. And then there'll be another mic uh, to the extent that we have overflow. Uh, there will probably be another mic that uh, can accommodate the group that would be in the overflow area so that uh, the amount of uh, traversing that people have to do and you know, crossing the paths and whatnot can be minimized. And then, of course, there'll be, uh, uh, there'll be separate microphones for me for the the uh, town council for Connor and for the select board. And Tom, you do remember correctly on that. It, we, had, uh, we had actually discussed that we would have a single microphone for the, and a single aisle uh, for the main tent, specifically because we wanted to try to maximize the number of people that we could keep under the tent. And two aisles would then decrease how many folks we could actually have under the tent before we had to start using overflow. Okay. Now, during our normal town meetings, when we hosted in the auditorium at the middle school, there is a certain amount of wandering, gathering to discuss articles that are coming up. Will you be discouraging that kind of activity? In a word, yes. Okay. <laughs> You're in charge, you know, Tom. <laughs> we're, uh, you know, we're, we have to be mindful of the fact that um, you know, the more wandering or any wandering that goes on runs the risk of, of uh, violating the social distancing. And so um, you obviously you will be able to leave the, the tent or leave the overflow area for um, biology breaks and so on. But in, in terms of uh, allowing any congregation while the meeting is ongoing or any other milling around, we're simply not going to allow that. Okay. Uh, and this will be the first town meeting that food is allowed. <laughs> yeah, we're not inside the school auditorium. Right. Um, 
So there won't be anybody regulating kind of the distancing or marking. So we're going to ask that all town people just regulate yourselves, keep your distance, there stay will be, safe. There will be definitely some people who are in charge of regulating it. How active they'll be able to be with the number of people will definitely be uh, a challenge potentially. But, you know, like Tom said, if he sees that there's some, you know, milling about or people trying to congregate in a certain area of the hall, then he can say something to them. And if they're not going to follow the rules that we have set in order to protect everyone there, uh, then the, the I'm sure that the health director of the fire department or police department can move them along to outside the hall while they proceed to do that. Okay. Um, so now, do you anticipate having any kind of trouble hearing the votes being called? We'll, we'll have an adequate audio set up so that hearing should not be a, a problem. Okay. We are exploring uh, the use of an outside audio vendor to, uh, to handle those arrangements in the event that, uh, that we have uh, any concerns that the use of the school systems might not be as effective as we would like. Oh, okay. Uh, and visual displays are not going to be used. There will be no PowerPoints, correct? There, there will be no PowerPoints, uh, so there won't be a video screen. What we've encouraged the various uh, individuals who will present is to provide what they would ordinarily put onto a PowerPoint in hard copy. And so that hard copy will be distributed to meeting participants so that they have the ability to follow along through the hard copy mm -hmm. as opposed to what they would do ordinarily through a video screen. So we will attempt to uh, accommodate that uh, in, in, again, in a, in a hard copy fashion. So to me, it sounds like you guys have thought of everything. Um, I wanna thank you both for taking the time out to make this video with us. Uh, which will be shown on EHOP's website, as well as it will be sitting on uh, HCAM's uh, YouTube channel and their website. Um, but I just want to reiterate the points that um, Connor and Tom have shared with us today, um, being that you need to show up early, um, as soon as 8.30, so that they can get everybody checked in before the start of town meeting. Uh, I think get comfortable. Once you're in your seat, you're in your seat. Um, and so your activity is going to be limited uh, to kind of speaking at the mic and using the, the restrooms. Um, and I spoke to Tom the other day and one of his points was to educate yourselves ahead of time so you know your vote before the meeting um, and it'll move along a lot faster. Uh, and last but not least, I would embrace the weekend town meeting. Uh, this could be a nice change going forward instead of three late nights at the middle school. Uh, but I'm not gonna make any assumptions there. So again, I'd just like to thank you for joining us for this segment of EHOP's Know Your Vote. And thank you, Connor and Tom, for your time. Um, and so please note that we do have three other segments that complete this series. Um, coming up, we will be interviewing um, a member of the select board, the town manager, uh, the planning board and CPC, and the school committee. Um, so this is a great way to educate yourself on the articles and allows you to reach out to the proper sources if you have any questions before town meeting. Okay, good afternoon. Hello, Hopkinton. My name is Amy Ritterbush with EHOP. Uh, this is one in a four-part series where we'll be meeting with town officials to discuss the articles to be voted on at town meeting, which will be held on Saturday, September 12th. Joining me here today via Zoom is Gary Trundle, who is chair of the planning board and also a member of the Community Preservation Committee, otherwise known as CPC. So thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to meet with us. Um, and then I'd like to jump right into some questions. All right, thanks, Amy. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yes. Um, there's been some confusion about the planning board articles on the warrant because the planning board put the articles forth on the warrant, but then they plan to make a motion for no action at town meeting on all the articles. So the public is wondering, can they just still discuss and vote on these articles or not? Um, I think that's the first question. Um, sure. Do you want to do you want to just go through all the questions so that I can speak to sort of provide a little bit of history and background on it and, and answer your questions directly? Sure. And then, um, so can the public still discuss and vote on these articles? Do the zoning articles require a simple majority or two thirds? 
And what happens if a zoning article is voted down or no action is taken? Is there a difference? Is it true that they can't be brought back in future years? Okay. Okay. Got it. So I think it's worth giving a little bit of background here. And, and this was, uh, I think this was a, a, a challenging debate for, for us as a planning board. And, you know, I think that our initial approach here was that a lot have, has, of time and effort has been put into these zoning articles. We feel that they're very important. Um, and the first time that we voted on whether or not we would withdraw them, I think the general consensus was that, um, that at least one of them was particularly important and impactful um, and if we were going to include that one in the warrant, then we should probably just include all of them. And um, we ended up scheduling a, a, a second meeting um, in part to, to revisit that. And I think what really drove a change um, for how the planning board was viewing these articles was just thinking more comprehensively about public safety. And you know, at the end of the day, the, the guidance that we got from our town officials was that we really, in the interest of public safety, we're trying to minimize the risk of, of uh, you know, of, of spreading infection. And the, the less debate that we had, the less people were up at the mic talking, um, you know, the, the shorter amount of time that people were at the, the, the town meeting, um, the, the, the more we would be protecting the public safety and the, the public and, and minimizing the, the safety risk. And so we revisited that. Unfortunately, at that point, the warrant had already been signed by the select board. So at that point, the planning board chose to take the action to, um, to, to recommend no action. And so what that means is that um, the, the motion on the floor will actually be to take no action, which effectively just carries over the article uh, until a, a, a future town meeting. Um, and, but it does require a vote to do that. Um, there is some possibility that the, the vote to take no action would be, um, would be um, denied. And if that's the case, then there would be uh, a new motion uh, to move the article forward. Um, so I'll just want to clarify yes. for the public too. So when you Perfect. vote no on no action, then that means a new motion can take place, which could be a voting in the affirmative or an editing, you know, a slight amendment to the motion. Yes. So if, if the motion of no action is, is uh, denied, then we would likely move forward with a new motion, which would be the, uh, the, the article as it stands um, in the warrant. And then that would in, in turn initiate discussion and debate and an eventual vote on the article um, as written in the warrant. Okay, and so then what if someone, say they vote down no action, and then someone brings a new motion forward and they vote no on the new motion, then what happens? Okay, so if, if the motion was to, 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 say for example, the solar overlay, if the, if the motion um, to move no action was denied, um, then there would be a new motion to um, recommend the solar overlay um, for the town of Hopkinton as stated in the warrant. Um, there would be debate, and if, if that new motion was denied, um, then we would have no solar overlay. Um, the article cannot be brought back forth um, in its current state in a future for, for two years. But if there are material changes to the proposed article, then it can be brought back in um, the, next, the next town meeting. Okay. I think that's important for people to know because zoning articles usually require a two-thirds vote. Uh, a majority, and that can be really hard to get. Some articles might get 60%, but if they don't get the two thirds, they're not gonna go forward. Yeah, that's but a great point. Two thirds is a, is a, is a big threshold and it, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like a big difference from 50%, but just having been to a lot of town meetings, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger threshold than people expect. And um, it really is a, you know, it's a, it's a super majority. It takes some, takes a, the, over the, the majority of, not the majority, but it takes a, a super majority of, of people in town to be supportive of it. Okay, so say an article comes for a vote, it does not get the super majority, um, then it, it could be brought back in a future year if it's changed to some, it changed enough, I guess, and they would have a new hearing. And then if it, it has back. material changes material to it, changes. then it can be brought back. So for the solar overlay district, for example, if the map changed, maybe that would be a material change. Possibly, yes. Possibly, okay. 
So that is good to know. I think that covers the basic questions about um, how zoning articles work. So I thought maybe we could do a quick overview of some of the key zoning articles. I know some of them are housekeeping, but um, this one, article number 13 about car washes in the downtown business district, people will probably remember that last year, a similar article came forward and got a majority, but not the super majority. So it was voted down. So what's yeah, the difference this year? Yeah, great example. So the, the article last year was to, um, to, to add car washes um, as a special permit in, um, in the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on it, but I think it's the industrial A or B. I don't remember which one it is. I think it was, yeah, the one at South Street, but I believe. Effectively over on South Street. And then at the same time, remove car washes from the downtown business district. And what we heard at town meeting is that people um, really didn't feel, that they weren't, they weren't convinced that we should um, uh, allow for car washes over um, on South Street, but they definitely felt that we should not allow for car washes by special permit in the downtown business district. So this article removes car washes as an allowable use in the downtown business district. Um, but doesn't add them anywhere else. Doesn't add them anywhere else, correct. Okay, good to know. Okay, article 16 is about accessory dwelling units. So if you could explain what that is, people may not understand. Yeah, so, so accessory dwellings are, um, you know, are, are, are uh, uh, living quarters that are um, part of a single family residence, but are separate. So if you had, um, a, you know, a, an apartment or, you know, what we'd call a, a mother-in-law apartment or a, a granny flat or, um, you know, any type of, of separate living quarters that's in a, um, in a, uh, a, a single family residence that would be considered an accessory dwelling. And, and this article, proposed? Yeah. yeah, so this article updates the zoning bylaws, uh, really does two things. Number one, it removes the requirement that occupants must be family, quote, related by blood, marriage, or adoption. And it also removes an age restriction. So the previous accessory dwelling um, bylaw um, stated that that uh, it must be occupied by um, a family member related by blood marriage or adoption, um, or um, that they needed to be uh, over the age of, I believe it was 55. Um, so this removes that. And, and really the, the basis for this is there are many living situations that were previously not allowed that, that we think would be appropriate. Um, if you had a, a caretaker, if you had um, unmarried partners of, of adult children, if you had uh, an adult with a disability of some kind, um, a lot of different circumstances that, that we think would be a reasonable um, use for an accessory dwelling that, that previously weren't allowed. Um, and then the second part of it is removing the requirement for an interior connection. So previously, um, the accessory dwelling had to have an interior door that would connect the two spaces. Um, and you know, and, and again, I think the, the argument for us here is that, um, you know, by, by removing that, you could have a wholly separate living quarters. Um, and then also you could have uh, an independent structure to serve as an accessory dwelling. So, you know, so like you had what a they detached... call the, the granny pod or something. Yes, yes, yes okay. exactly. Um, and I do, do want to note too, that there are a lot of other additional details and requirements. Um, you know, I know that, that both Zach and the planning board have had a lot of discussions about this. And what we want to make sure is we want to make sure that, you know, single family resident neighborhoods don't turn into to multifamily apartment buildings and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, I, I think that, that probably the, the most relevant pieces are number one, that, that, you know, the second unit does need to be a, an, an accessory and it also needs to be quite a bit smaller. So there's a maximum square footage of 800 square feet, which um, again, it's just to sort of drive home the, the primary versus the secondary use of the, um, of the units. Okay, great. Okay, article uh, 17 is non-conforming lots, uses, and structures. I think this was requested by the Board of Appeals. They see a lot of these. Yes, that's correct. Um, and so this article would allow for a waiver by the zoning enforcement officer um, for modifications to non-conforming lots that either, that, that don't alter the footprint or overall height of the pre-existing structure. So what that means, if you have a non-conforming lot, which means it doesn't quite fit into the standard zoning requirements, but it was built a long time ago. Um, currently, if you wanted to make a modification to it, such as adding dormers or maybe screening in a porch or something like that, um, you would have to go in front of the, the, the Board of Appeals. And um, what this amendment does is it allows for a waiver by the zoning enforcement officer um, 
when the, the footprint isn't changed, when the height isn't changed, um, and assuming you have signatures of all of your abutters. So it's just trying to sort of uh, eliminate what the Board of Appeals feels is an unnecessary, um, you know, it's an unnecessary type of type of hearing that, that they, they think there's a, a cleaner, simpler way to um, to to address these these types of, of changes. And I know I've seen those in my neighborhood. I live in an older neighborhood and the neighbor wanted to remove a porch and add a new one that was exactly the same size as the one removed, but because that one that was being removed was too close to the property line for current standards, they had to go to Board of Appeals. Yeah. So great example. Yeah. Okay, and the next one, uh, the number 18 is temporary signs. And I think this relates to the Main Street Corridor project and other, yep. other construction projects. Yep, it does. Um, and, uh, you know, and this is really born out of um, trying to support local businesses, um, in particular through the Main Street Corridor project, um, recognize that there's gonna be a lot of disruption and that the, there may be different parking arrangements and um, different street flows and whatnot. So um, this article just, uh, it allows for um, expanded use of temporary signs for businesses impacted by construction. Um, important to note that it, it does apply across um, you know, any zone where businesses are today. Um, so it's not just the Main Street Corridor project. We felt that it was important that we're not writing in bylaws that have kind of a, a very, very uh, a limited period of use. And we, we felt that the idea of temporary signage for businesses impacted by construction made sense regardless of, of what zone they were in. All right, and then now um, article number 19 is the one that I think is gonna probably generate the most discussion at town meeting about um, commercial solar voltaic um, installations. Yeah. And do you wanna go over a little bit what that intends to do? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, some standard questions about it too. So, um, you know, I, I would say just in my time on the planning board, the, the, the commercial solar proposals have been some of the most challenging to, to deal with. And, um, you know, and, and, I, and, and one of the, so, so this is really an attempt for us to gain a little bit more um, control over where these commercial solar farms are, are installed or where they're, where they're approved. Um, and to make sure that we're also protecting our residential neighborhoods and our, our natural resources. So just to summarize, currently today, um, commercial solar is uh, an allowable use in any of our zoning districts. Um, it is allowable by special permit. Um, there are numerous additional requirements, uh, including a three acre minimum lot size, there's screening requirements, there's underground utility requirements. Um, and actually, uh, even at town meeting last year, we made some additional modifications to the, the solar bylaw that, that actually um, we hope improves the, the screening and, and, and really trying to, to um, help reduce the negative impact on, on abutters. But the, 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 at the end of the day, they're, they're still allowed in any commercial zone. Um, and so the Zoning Advisory Committee was looking at how other towns have, have managed the situation. And one of the things they found is that some towns um, have created a, uh, a commercial solar overlay which actually specifies um, you know, specific parcels in which solar is allowed, thereby um, not allowing it in, on parcels that are not included within that solar overlay district. So um, in the new model that we propose, we've, we've had a lot of debate, um, we've had a lot of discussion, we've had a lot of public input here. Um, we've created a, a, a map of what we think are appropriate parcels with some consideration that, that details that. Um, and in the new process, um, same as before, that it's still subject to planning board and conservation committee review. Um, it still has, uh, those properties still have screening and setback requirements, um, lot size, screening underground utilities, uh, all still, all still apply. Okay. And I should just add one more point that I should have mentioned earlier really quickly. Um, solar when used as an accessory use, meaning not the primary use of the property, uh, like on a rooftop or over a parking lot is still allowed and would continue to be allowed in any zoning district. So this doesn't impact your ability to put solar on a roof or it doesn't affect Dell EMC's ability to put it on uh, over a parking lot or you know, any other municipal building or that sort of thing. It's really only these commercial 
solar proposals that we're talking about here. Okay, so homeowners can still put solar panels on their roof whether or not they live in the solar overlay district if it were to pass. Correct. Okay, and businesses can put it on their parking lots. Okay, and then let's see, and how will this affect, if it passes, any current solar projects that are um, in the works but not built yet? Yeah, so um, that's a tricky one. Um, and um, so, so let me just try and summarize this, but under Massachusetts law, a proposed change to a zoning bylaw will apply to any special permit that a planning board issues after the board's notice for the public hearing on that zoning change. So let me just explain what that means, because I think a lot of questions come up on the Seaboard Solar Proposal over on Franklin Road. Um, that was, uh, that special permit um, was approved by the planning board earlier this year. Um, but that planning board was done um, after the board noticed for the solar overlay uh, public hearing. So what that means is that if this uh, overlay were to move forward and it were approved, um, then the amended zoning bylaw will apply to Franklin Road special permit, which means the Franklin Road project developer will be prevented by the amending zoning bylaw to proceed with the project. Okay. And say, I guess they probably won't have it built by before town meeting. If it would, were already built, they would not have that obstacle, right? Okay. That's correct. Okay. Yes. It's not so if they had already, built. if they had already, they had already been issued all their permits, mm -hmm. um, then they would not be affected. Okay. So that's certainly a lot for everybody to think about. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion at town meeting on it. I think it's worth noting, um, you know, so, so with regards to the map, if I could just make a few comments on it. Um, yeah. And you know, and again, this was really hard to figure out where it, what parcels it makes sense to include in the solar overlay. And, you know, Zach, I, I should just say going back to the, the, the meeting process, um, so the advisory committee had uh, talked about this over a series of, of five public meetings. Um, the planning board has discussed it at six planning meetings. Um, all of those have been well represented by the public of, of those both in support and, and oppo in opposition of the solar overlay project. Um, and, you know, really what, what zoning advisory committee used for consideration is, is four things. Uh, number one, um, how far is the parcel from residential neighborhoods? Um, two, how much of the property is, is wooded and, you know, with the intent of really trying to limit, um, limit clear cutting or, or disturbing the, the, um, the, the, the current makeup of the land. Uh, three, ample space on the lot for visual screening to make sure that, uh, you know, people don't have a, a wall of, of solar panels up, up next to them. Um, and then uh, we also did consider uh, lots that were previously approved for commercial solar. Okay. So I think um, we'll move on to the CPC articles now. Um, I know you're not the chair of the CPC, but, um, but you serve on that committee. So... Um, Let's see, do you, could you give a brief overview of what the CPC is and wh where the money comes from for these projects? Yeah, so the, the, the CPC uh, was born out of the Community Preservation Act. Um, it's a Massachusetts program that was um, started in, in, in 2000. Um, so it's, it's 20 years in existence. And basically the way it works is that um, Hopkinton has a, a, a tax surcharge on our property taxes. Um, and that money goes into a fund, and then that fund gets um, a partial match from um, from state resources um, that 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 give the town uh, additional funds to spend on on various forms of what we call community preservation, and that fits into a couple of different buckets, um, and those buckets could be. Um, could be recreation, they could be preservation, they could be um, open space, um, uh, acquiring open ha space, uh, affordable, affordable housing, housing is one. Yeah, mm -hmm. store preservation. Yep. yep, yep. So so it's really just a, it's a means for the town to get some, um, to get some additional support from the state to invest in things that, that, that we believe are important um, for our community in those different, different categories of, of spending. And the nice thing is, I believe it's a 2% surcharge on our taxes. And so the money, we already have the money because it's already been collected. So it's not an asking for an override or debt exclusion on these yep, projects. That is correct. 
Okay. And then a lot of the CPC requests every year are very small, under 25,000. But I thought maybe we should go over the ones that are a little bit larger this year. So number 12C is 400,000 for store preservation of the exterior of the Hopkinton Center for the Arts. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so hopefully people know what the uh, Hopkinton Center for the Arts is. It, it, you know, the, the barn went through a fairly substantial renovation a few years ago, and they've um, updated many parts of the interior of the building as well. Um, this is for um, preserving the exterior of the original farmhouse that, that's in front. What um, used to be the haunted house when my kids were little. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, I, I, I know of it as a Terry farm. Yeah. Um, but, um, but, but yeah, so that's – and it's um, – yeah, it's, it's funds that would be to, to renovate the exterior of the house and to do so in a, in a, you know, through a historic preservation lens. Great. Okay, so uh, number 12F is $74,000 for a campus trail connector. And I hope this isn't the one that was removed. It was, no, I think this is still on there. Uh, no, this is, I think this is still on there. Okay. Um, and, and so this actually... Um, you know, one of the things that they're looking to do is they're looking to, to provide further connectivity between the different, um, between the different school campuses within Hopkinton. Um, and this money also ties to a grant from the state. So um, again, um, you know, Hopkinton isn't footing the entire bill for this. It really is, is extending uh, and, and building new trails um, between a couple of our, um, between a couple of our school campuses. Okay, and then number 12I is $75,000 for stormwater drainage, but for the skate park at EMC Park? Um, yes, so for those of you that know EMC Park, um, you know, last year actually CPC funded the, the playground improvements, um, and there was previously a skate park back there that, um, that uh, Parks and Rec actually proposed um, a, a refresh and, and, and remodeling of the skate park. Um, but one of the problems back there is that um, there's there's some pretty substantial stormwater drainage issues back behind the skate park. And okay. so in, in discussions with the CPC and the Parks and Rec, they decided that before they go allocate and support money to design and build a new skate park, that they should probably solve um, the stormwater drainage issue first. Um, that was number one. And then number two, given that, um, you know, I, I think – given that we don't really have a, a good firm estimate as to what the skate park costs, then this $75,000 would also um, support um, a, a more accurate um, design and bid for the skate park so that uh, in, a, in a future year, um, CPC can come to annual town meeting with a, um, a, a more accurate and specific ask to, to build out the skate park. Okay, that sounds good. And. Um... Let's see. And because we're trying to limit how much time we spend physically at town meeting this year, if residents um, still have questions about CPC articles or zoning articles, is there someone they can email or call um, maybe at town hall to get more yeah. information? Yeah. Um, so so um, planning questions can go to John Gelsich, our, our town planner, and he's a, a great resource. Um, and he's, um, he's at, at town hall. Okay. Um, for CPC related um matter I, I should say also for planning board matter you can always reach out to, to me as well and um and uh my address is located my email address is located on the, the hopkinton website um and then um for cpc related questions i'd really recommend reaching out to, to ken weiss mantle who is the chair of the cpc um and he his uh cpc email is also available on on the town website Okay. Yeah, and I really do recommend that people um, ask their questions in advance if they can so that we can reduce the time of, that we have to ask questions at town meeting. So if you have planning board related uh, questions, you can always reach out to me and to Amy's point. We'd rather ask you ahead of time and if we can answer those just to, again, kind of minimize the discussion and uh, debate that we have at town meeting. Uh, my email is planningboardchair at hopkintonma dot g o v so planning board chair at hopkinton m a dot g o v okay great and then i think that's about wraps it up um please do try to get your questions answered in advance so the meeting can move along quickly a huge thank you to gary trundle a planning board chair for meeting with us today and of course to hcam for producing this show hello hopkinton I'm Nanda Barker-Hook, and I'm here with Norman Kamalo, our town manager, 
for EHOP's annual Know Your Vote Social Distancing Edition. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Kamala, for taking the time to answer a few questions about town meeting for us. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Nanda. Uh, and also thank you to EHOP for continuing to provide this service to the community, a service that I deem very essential for our democratic process here in town. You are making information available in advance to our citizens here in Hopkinton, in advance of town meeting. Thanks, thank you. Um, this interview is one of a four part series about town meeting and this year's um, articles on the warrant. And as many people who are watching have heard for the first time, town meeting is gonna be held on a Saturday, uh, September 12th at 9.30 in the morning outside at the high school. And this year, the warrant is especially short um, in order to reduce the length of um, town meeting in general for everyone's health and safety. So I want to ask by, I want to start by asking a question that might seem simple to you, um, Mr. Kamala, but perhaps is not so obvious to residents, which is how has COVID impacted the town budget? Um, and are we receiving state aid and is that aid covering our needs? First off, our hearts ache for those who have lost loved ones and have been negatively impacted by COVID-19. I know that here in Hawkington, some of us have lost jobs. Uh, some of us have had salaries cut because of COVID-19. I also want to thank community of Hopkinton, our first responders and town hall staff for their service, excellent service during this very day. On the revenue side, COVID-19 resulted in lower than expected new growth in the tax base, which is mostly tied, as you know, to residential new construction and residential upgrades and improvements activities that slowed down from March 2020 to June 2020. Additionally, local aid from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, while showing a 5.4% increase, is somewhat lower than originally anticipated. And expected receipts from our motor vehicle excise tax are expected to be down somewhat when, as you have seen in past years, they typically rise each year. On the expense side, the proposed budget severely limits growth in staffing to just positions in the Hopkinton Public Schools that serve the direct needs of a growing student population in the classroom. And the addition of a single police officer to be funded in its initial year by the Legacy Farms Host Community Agreement. Overall, priorities in the budget are as follows. Sustain community services at fiscal 2020 levels. Fund only new classroom positions for Hopkinton Public Schools to address on enrollment growth. Defer all capital spending to future years. Meet contractual obligations for salary adjustments. Minimize the use of one-time funding to support recurring expenses. And significantly, preserve stabilization reserves to the extent possible as the eventual length of the recession is uncertain. In another noteworthy area, the Hopkinton Parks and Recreation Enterprise was severely impacted by COVID-19 in fiscal year 2020. We will be asking town meeting to consider a warrant article to fund that shortfall from existing parks and recreation retained earnings and the town's unrestricted certified free cash. In response to lessons learned from COVID-19, parks and recreation, which is run with an operating subsidy from the general fund, is proposed to be deconsolidated with some high level programmatic costs to be covered by a new parks and rec department budget in the general fund, 
costs to support the town common, our beautiful town common, and other public spaces to be covered by an online item in the Department of Public Works. User fee programs for camps, clinics, and other fee-based programs to be operated break even through a revolving fund. And for revenue and expenses at the Fruit Street facility, which has become one of the key destinations in town, uh, to remain as the sole activity covered under the existing Parks and Rec Enterprise Fund for fiscal year 2020. As final notes about the town's financial health, our cash position and cash flow is on track. The receipt of local aid from the state has continued without interruption. And the town standard and pause triple A bond rating, which allows the town to borrow at very low interest rates, was reviewed and affirmed in May 2020 in the depth of the uncertainty caused by COVID-19. So in a nutshell, those are the impacts of COVID-19 on our FY20 budget. In terms of, you asked the question whether state uh, COVID relief aid covers our needs or there's a gap. The town has received federal aid under the CARES Act, under emergency declarations for FEMA, and the schools have access to additional aid under a special education provision of the CARES Act. While this source is tremendously helpful, there are restrictions on their use, gaps compared to our pre-COVID-19 expectations do exist, as discussed. Thank you. Um, that was a, a lot of detail, very helpful detail. I have a, a couple of follow-up questions to say so that I can better understand. Um, the, I think you said the one of the priorities for the budget is to sustain level funding from FY 2020. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, as our town grows, does that mean we're going to be offering the same level of services for everybody in our growing population in FY21? That's another very good question. Um, sustaining community services at fiscal year 2020 level is one of the dominant goals of the FY21 budget. The budget does allow for continuation of current service levels through fiscal year 2021, and also includes significant targeted service increases for the Hopkinton Public Schools in fiscal year 2021, directly supporting classroom contact for a growing student population. Other service levels will remain substantially unchanged, except for the addition of the police officer that I mentioned earlier. Okay, all right, very good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so something that you also mentioned was, it's very unusual this year, um, or FY21, we're not going to have any capital spending, spending or borrowing planned for FY21. So, that's really unusual. Normally we're voting on new police cars or new fire trucks or new classrooms. There's always something. So I'm wondering what the impact is gonna be with having no capital or borrowing in FY21. How is that gonna impact our infrastructure and our services this coming year? Um, and are we going to be expecting more capital requests at next town meeting in 2021 as a result? All things being equal, it would be preferable to continue with capital improvements. However, COVID-19 is an unprecedented pandemic and calls for extraordinary measures. Deferring the actions that have been planned will result in an aging of our infrastructure as far as capital development is concerned. The town has carefully evaluated each request that has been deferred to ensure that none of the deferrals create a safety issue for the town's residents or staff, and to ensure that none of the deferrals 
will generate more costly repairs down the road as a result of the delay. The decision to recommend delay in all capital improvements was made with a priority to one, support the increased operating budget needs, especially um, uh, in the school department. It was also made with the idea of holding on to available resources because the tempo of the recovery is uncertain. By this approach, the town will be in a position to continue sustaining service in fiscal year 2022 and beyond if the economic recovery is slow. The multi-year budget, which is on page 14 of the Appropriations Committee report, which is now been released, estimated a spike in capital spending in fiscal years 2022 to 2023 as a way to deliver from the deferrals in this year's budget. And those proposals will be carefully revisited in the next budget cycle, as you rightly pointed out. There's more information about the shape and the tempo of the recovery is known. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> You mentioned the Appropriations Committee report, um, which is, I recommend if anybody wants to learn about the budget or sort of the big picture of the budget going forward in FY21, it's a great document. You can find it on ehop.org. Um, I assume you can find it on the town website. Um, just to jump ahead to another question, where would someone find the Appropriations Committee report on the website? The Appropriations Committee report is on the town website. And what I will do right after this meeting is to make sure that it prominently features okay. uh, on the main page. Uh, it, it is going to be our key reference document at town meeting and therefore we, we should put it prominently on the opening page. Okay, that's terrific. Uh, I find that it's very a uh, great way to sort of understand the big picture, um, to read the, at least the first few pages which summarize sort of what to expect in this coming fiscal year. Um, let's see, I'm wondering in general, um, the tax impact of the FY21 budget. How, how is an average household, and in Hopkinton, an average house is worth $632,500, according to the Appropriations Committee report. So someone who owns a house of that amount, how is it going to impact their tax bill? Another very good question. And as you know, that's uh, one of the topics of primary focus um, on the part of the select board during any budget process. Specifically to you, your question, for a person with the average value Hopkinton home assessed at 632,500, which is last year's tax level of approximately 10,638, will rise about $298 in connection with the general government spending within the tax levy as controlled by Proposition 2 and a half. And by another $115 in connection with the new debt for the construction of 16 public school classrooms. In total, the rise would be from 10,638 to about 11,051. As you know, this is an approximation because several factors, including the actual amount of new growth in the tax base, will not be finalized until October. So from all of that, I heard specifically $298 increase for someone who owns a uh, home worth $632,500. Yes. Was it additional, I, I didn't understand the part about the classrooms. Is that also in addition? 
you're correct, yes. The, the debt service for the new 16 public school classrooms has an impact of one one five hundred and fifteen dollars okay okay so in total then the the, the the dollar amount would be 298 dollars plus 115 dollars would be the increase for an average homeowner. correct okay so i'd like to ask about the status of the legacy farms community host agreement as it relates to funding um, for those who may not be familiar, the community host agreement is an agreement that the town and the developer of Legacy Farm signed that includes provisions if school enrollment exceeds specific numbers. Um, and the, the agreement was just renegotiated this past June. So can you give us an update on the status of payments um, that have been made by the developer, what is still owed, and how the money is going to be allocated? The developer has made two sets of payments. The payments that were made in the old agreement and the payments that have been made under update seven. Let me start off with the payments made under the old agreement. $500,000 was paid and transferred to the school stabilization fund. Two sets of payments in the amount of $120,000 were paid towards public safety agencies and infrastructure. Those are the two payments under the old agreement. Let's now look at the payments under the new agreement. I'll start with the payments to this school department stabilization fund. A total four million and thirty one thousand three hundred. So it's four zero three one three hundred. Here's the schedule for those payments. 831,300 was to be paid within three business days of the full execution of Amendment 7. 1,246,950 to be paid on or before July 30th, 2020. 1,200,000 on or before June 30th, 2021. And 753,050 on or before December 31, 2021. To date, 831,300 was paid on June 25th, 2020. 1,246,950 was paid on July 30th, 2020. This, this leaves two outstanding payments. The first is 1,200,000 due June 30th, 2021. And the second is the 753,050 due December 31, 2021. Moving on. 13,190 paid to the town for the use in the town's discretion as further mitigation for the project within three business days of the date of the seventh amendment. That amount is fully paid as of now. It was paid on June 25th. 2020. Next, by June 30th, 2021, $500,000 is due to the town for the purpose of defraying the design cost of a new public safety facility. 
again, this amount is due 2021. Next, $120,000 as mitigation for the costs incurred by the town again, in dealing with increased demands on public safety agencies and infrastructure due on the date of the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the 90th, 90th dwelling unit located within the senior housing development. Last but not least, $3 million due to the town for the development of the Main Street Corridor project, including the separated bike lanes, which are the component of the townwide fair network, fully paid. Okay. Um, thank you for all that information. The, the first sums of money that you mentioned, roughly the 831,000, and then there was 1,246,000, and then 1,002,000, and then 753. Are those all relating to the schools, those payments, or are they the, in terms of allocation of those particular funds, um, I don't think you mentioned sort of where those were going. Um, okay. They are going to the school department stabilization fund. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. So um, just a couple of last questions. This one is um, relating to new growth. First, I just wanted to make sure that I have this correct. The term new growth, we use that, it basically describes new taxes coming into town from new construction. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So new growth is expected to go down by 18% FY20 to FY21, according to the Appropriations Committee report. And meanwhile, education spending and employee benefits are on the rise. And this Im imbalance appears to be growing and has been on the radar for some time now. Um, the Appropriations Committee has expressed concern about su sustaining the budget going forward. Um, the town is forecasting a deficit of over a million dollars in FY24. And I'm wondering if you can just comment on that and talk about what the town is doing to prepare for that and how it might impact our taxes going forward. This is a brilliant question that accurately identifies a key financial challenge on the town's horizon. On the revenue side, Proposition 2.5 limits property tax increases at 2.5%. And for several years, the town has been able to both cover salary and benefit expenses substantially in excess of 2.5%, as well as additional costs for new positions by relying on very robust new growth. As a specific illustration of the town's reliance on new growth, even with the projected drop off in new growth revenue in fiscal year 2021, new growth will still provide over 48% of the new property tax revenue for Hopkinton. If new growth slows after the completion of legacy farms with the budget focus, an imbalance will emerge as revenue growth is kept at a number closer to 2.5%. If compensation costs for existing and needed staffing levels continue to grow at a rate substantially above 2.5%, that's going to be a challenge. Further, if school enrollment continues to rise, it is likely that additional debt will need to be taken on and serviced in connection with new school construction, further amplifying this challenge. On a macro level, the town is preparing for this challenge by clearly identifying the issue to support 
broad public discussion about the trade-off between the desire for quality services and the acceptability of tax burden. No wonder the selector every year emphasize tax impact. Ultimately, future sessions of the town meeting will strike this balance. On a more tactical level, the town continues to manage and control costs by aggressively managing healthcare and other significant costs, by tightly controlling staff growth outside the enrollment-driven public schools, and by maintaining strong financial reserves and financial policies that support future borrowing at the lowest possible cost. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's um. That's a lot to digest. As as uh, and it does seem like a, a definite challenge moving ahead. Um, so I expect we'll be hearing more about it and more discussions about it, sort of moving forward. Um, I'm just doing my best to sort of keep up on a general level, you know, not being involved in the daily numbers in any way or being in town hall, it's sort of, uh, it can be hard to sort of understand the bigger implications, but this, this issue did sort of jump as something that seems to come up every year in the budget discussions or more in more recent years um, and is worth sort of highlighting as a, as a challenge moving forward. Um, okay, so my last question is a very topical question. It relates to recent national and local discussions about divesting funds from police departments um, and reallocating them to non-policing forms of public safety and community support, such as social services, youth services, mental health, um, and other community resources. And we're curious if there are any shift in funds of this nature in the, in the public safety budget in FY21. In terms of providing content, I think it is helpful to, to think of two things. Um, one, one of, I think, the accomplishments um, that this community uh, has um, in a very long list of things that we do well is how we have grown the Youth and Family Services Department in the past years. Um, I have been with the community uh, for 10 years and I can say proudly uh, that I have had a front row seat um, watching the growth and effectiveness of, of that department. And simultaneously, uh, in my last response to how we're going to manage the, the balance um, between the dwindling new growth and the growing needs, I mentioned how we've tactfully been control. And to that end, if you look at the police department budget, it hasn't grown substantially at all. Mm -hmm. And relative to the proposed FY21 budget, it's important to notice the following. The Hawkington Police Department budget only grows by 0.9%, less than 1%. The Hawkington Public Schools budget is growing by 6.6%. KIFTEC, the Regional Vocational Technical School budget, is growing up by 12.9%. And most spectacularly, and proudly so, the Youth and Family Services Department is growing up by 32.2%. The fiscal year 2021 pro budget provides all the funding needed 
to sustain our excellent police services at the FY 2020 levels and includes the $60,000 in legacy farms, non-education post community agreement funding to support the addition of that one police officer. The proposed budget does not include additional specific shifts in funding from public safety to other categories. However, I can say, as you may know, over the past years, the town has relied on our free care, as well as end of year budget transfers. And I'm sure if you look at those numbers, you will see the police department sharing its budget with other departments. If people have follow-up questions um, and they want to learn more before showing up at town meeting, who, they, who should they direct the questions to and how can they have those answered? Yeah, um, specifically um, through uh, the town share university, as you know, we've now invested in the position of a CFO. And therefore, uh, all questions regarding the budget uh, should go through Tim O'Leary. Uh, he can be reached at the following email address, T-O-L-E-A-R-Y at hopkintonma.gov. Again, T-O-L-E-A-R at hawkingtonma.gov. A link to an extensive analysis of the fiscal 2021 budget can be found in the Appropriations Committee report on the homepage of the town website labeled Annual Town Meeting Appropriation Committee Report. Uh, you had asked this question, I've confirmed that report is on the town's landing page on the left hand side. You can click on the label Annual Town Meeting Appropriation Committee Report. Hard copies of this report will be available at the town meeting, and advanced hard copies can be obtained again by contacting Tim O'Leary. Thank you. Okay, great. We'll also write that up and, and post that alongside this video. Um, so I just want to thank you so much again, Mr. Kamala. We really appreciate your time, all the effort you put into coming up with all these good, uh, thorough answers. It's very helpful. Um, it's good to know where people can follow up with, with more questions. Hello, Hopkinton. My name is Tara Sando. This is the fourth of a four-part series where we'll be meeting with town officials to discuss the articles to be voted on at town meeting which will be held on Saturday, September 12th, outdoors at the high school. Joining us today via Zoom are Dr. Kavanaugh, Superintendent of Schools, Susan Brothmich, Director of Finance, and Amanda Fargiano, Chair of the School Committee. So welcome and thank you guys for taking the time out of your busy schedules to meet with us today. I can't even begin to imagine how busy you guys have been over the past couple of months. So we truly appreciate your time here. Uh, my intent is to make this interview as quick as possible uh, so that you can get back to the business of getting our students back up and running. Um, and if it's okay with you, I'm going to jump right in with Dr. Kavanaugh. Sure. Okay. So here we are 10 days before town meeting. Um, I've got a two part question to start off with and that's, um, has the select board and the Appropri appropriations committee signed off on the budget and is this the same budget that was initially signed off on in January? So yes, the select board and appropriations have signed off on the budget, but no, this is not the same budget that we had seen um, in January, specifically on the 16th. Um, so in January, both the select board and the school committee had approved the budget. It had not gotten to appropriations prior to the shutdown on March 10th. The budget that we had in January was 8.9% increase over FY20, and the one that we are looking at today is a 6.6 .6 increase over FY20. Okay. Um, 
So my next question is, um, in your presentation dated uh, May 28th, you shared a slide that is entitled uh, School Committee Budget Change After Economic Downturn. And there were five points on the slide, uh, which I think were the principles behind your approach to the renovated budget. Um, could you go through those five points of the focus on the classroom and maintaining instruction and so on? Sure, I'm happy to do that. And then Mrs. Rothermick can add in anything that I may have overlooked. Uh, so the five points are the first is a focus on the classroom. And what we meant by that is that when we were reducing the budget from the 8.9% increase to 6.6, .6, we really wanted to move away from eliminating any of the classroom teachers that we had been requesting. Uh, we had quite a few classroom teachers that we were looking at and you know that we were asking for those because of the increases in enrollment in the Hopkinton Public Schools. So if we were to leave those positions in, the goal was really to be able to reduce our class size and to make sure that the instruction in our classrooms would be maximized. Um, the second was maintaining instructional quality. So in addition to class size, we wanted to make sure that we were able to provide for our kids the materials and the technology that they would need as well. Uh, when we were reducing our one-time purchases, so out of the FY20 budget, you know, if there was any surplus there as a result of, you know, the closure, uh, we were able to purchase those one-time things such as textbooks, you know, things that are kind of big ticket items, but then we wouldn't have to take that money out of the FY21 budget because we would have already purchased them in FY20. Uh, other funding resources tend to be our grants and um, with deferring our capital projects, which was the fifth uh, sort of tenant on, on that list, um, that was really a town-wide decision. I believe that you know, every municipal entity uh, deferred all of their capital projects for this year. This is actually the smallest annual town meeting packet that I've ever seen. <laughs> so it should be a quick meeting. Um, it may also be the shortest school presentation. <laughs> I know all the controversy and drama is not included in this one. None. Um, so there is a reduction in a, the social emotional resources and a custodial reduction. Can you explain that um, to the reader of the budget? We just see like a, a line item reduction, um, but I know there's a lot of deliberation that goes into a cut like this. So I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Sure. So in sort of protecting um, the, the classroom, uh, when we were looking at making those reductions, we tried to steer away from personnel, but because personnel really does make up the biggest part of your budget, you know, we thought, okay, there are going to have to be some places where personnel, you know, are eliminated. We had an ask on the table for a 1.0 social emotional learning FTE, and that 1.0 FTE would have been half time at Elmwood and half time at Marathon. Uh, because we were able to get our class sizes down and because we really do have you know, good guidance staffing and BCBAs in those buildings, what we decided to do was to eliminate a 0.5 position in existence at Elmwood, as well as the 0.5 ask there, as well as the 0.5 ask at Marathon. So it was a half existing whole ask that came out to 1.5 FTEs. I hope that that's making sense. So one of the, half of the positions already existed in the district and the whole position that we eliminated was one that we had asked for but didn't intend to fill. I gotcha. Yes. Okay, uh, so, um, so beyond the budget, uh, which is what we're spending, you have received state funding and grants um, due to COVID. Can you briefly go over those? I know it doesn't affect what we're going over at town meeting, but it is just good information to have for the town. Sure, and maybe part of this piggybacks a little bit on um, the last question because we did eliminate three custodians from yes. the budget. Um, and they were three custodians that we had asked for. They weren't people who were already working in the district. Uh, so when we got the, the CARES Act money, there was $800,000 in you know, we use that as kind of an estimate. So the town got 1.6 million. We look at that as saying, well, you know, 800,000 might feasibly go to the public schools. Uh, with the coronavirus relief fund, we got $225 per student. And so that came to $866,000. And then there was 49,000 in the ESSER grant. And I can let Mrs. Rothermick talk a little bit about what she, um, 
sees us doing with all of that money. I know ESSER is largely curriculum, but you can certainly talk more, Susan, about where we're spending money on PPE and personnel and all of that. Sure. So basically the, the bottom line for the CARES and the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which is also CARES and ESSER is also CARES. So it, it all does fall under the same bucket. Um, it is to cover any expense that was not budgeted for. Um, so what we're running into is the need to hire additional custodians. That's something that was not budgeted. While it was asked for, this is a very different approach to how we um, are within our buildings. We're also looking at additional nursing staff. So those are, those are two of the personnel costs that we would look at for these grants but also we're moving to remote learning and really trying to preserve that students get a Hopkinton teacher. There's also an ask out there for additional teaching staff um, at the high school level. So those will all be charged in terms of personnel to the CARES funding, all three of those buckets, but it gives us the ability to be able to handle the teaching and learning of what needs to happen um, with this change in model, if you will, and again, non-budgeted. Then you get into the other expenses, such as PPE, which is masks, plexiglass, face shields, um, additional um, spray things to be able to clean, additional cleaning materials in general, as well as classroom materials to eliminate the need to share materials. So it really covers uh, the full gamut of how you run a school, but looking at it from a very different lens in terms of where we are with this um, virus. Yeah, and I will add, you know, it's really important to get our kids back into the classroom because I think that they need face time with teachers and they need a little bit of socialization with one another. But as you look at those numbers, you can see just how enormously expensive it is to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't need an exact number, but do you know the percentage of students that chose remote learning as opposed to the hybrid? District-wide, we have about 25-26% who are fully remote, and the wow. other 75-74% are um, coming in in the hybrid model. But what's interesting, I think, in the community might find this interesting, is that that differs from school to school. So at the Elmwood School, for example, 40% of the kiddos have, are, are, have chosen remote, for example, but at the high school, it's only 12%. So I wonder oh, if that wow. doesn't sort of translate, yes, to a, you know, in the second grade, parents feel like they kind of have a handle on the learning and they can guide their children through it more readily than, you know, a parent thinking I can teach my child BC Calc, for example, you know? Right. Yeah. Now, I know going into this budget season originally, there was a concern for the transportation cost. Is that still a concern or is that balanced out with the remote and hybrid combination? I will let Susan speak to that <laughs> because no one in the world has done more transportation work than Mrs. Rothermick this summer. <laughs> so the, the, the discussion that we always have with transportation uh, with any budget year is really tied to enrollment. So what we had done is added two additional buses in this budget year to be able to facilitate the enrollment increases that have happened. So that was something that was in the budget long before anything ever happened. Now what has changed is you, you have, um, to what Dr. Kavanaugh has just spoken to, 25% roughly, have chosen to do full remote. So no matter whether they rode the bus or not, that takes a, a certain population out. Then another 25% of the remaining have chosen that they do not need transportation. Uh, and, and there's all these guidelines that have changed in terms of how many students you can put on a bus. So those, that reduction in numbers has really helped us to hit those guidelines in terms of keeping the numbers low on a bus. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of, you know, will we be adding buses? Will we be doing all these other things? We have no capacity to add buses. There aren't buses out there to add. So the fact that parents opted off transportation has been very beneficial to us if, from an operations standpoint, 
because it has allowed us to bring those numbers down, keeping with the same number of buses. So it has not cost us um, any amount of money at, at this point in time. That's great. Yes. Now in the same line of conversation, the new models of remote and hybrid, have there been additional um, technology cost in order to outfit the students with Chromebooks or laptops or uh, iPads I heard were being distributed as well? So, and again, uh, Mrs. Rodman, you can jump right in, but the Chromebooks and the iPads and so sort of, you know, the actual device itself, those are things that we would have purchased anyway for our kids. You know, given the number of devices we have K to 12, um, we were pretty much a one-to-one -one district when all of this started. So that has not been really a cost for us, but what has been are, you know, the, the software and the applications that students are gonna be using. So we have, you know, Screencastify, for example, we just upgraded to a more deluxe model. Uh, Panopto, which allows our teachers to make videos to be pushed out. We have licenses for those for all of our teachers. Uh, Schoology, which is our new learning management system, so that kids in grades four to 12 kind of have one-stop shopping to navigate all of their coursework, where are the videos, where are the Zoom links, where are the worksheets, where is, you know, any of that stuff is all in one place. Where's the assessment? Module one, module two, it guides kids right through a course. So those are the things that we have spent the most money on as opposed to the devices. Okay. You just got me a little stressed out with all those different things, but <laughs> we're gonna make it through this year. We're all gonna figure it out together. <laughs> Um, now, uh, for the past couple of years, there have been issues with enrollment or growing enrollment and, and outfitting, you know, our schools to handle all these students. Now that we have a lot of remote learners, is that kind of balancing out this year? Space-wise, it's, you know, working out in our favor, obviously, because we're only bringing in half of our kids every day and roughly a quarter of our kids are not even coming into our building. So, you know, in terms of the physical plants, there's lots of space. One of the other things that we've been seeing, and I think um, Susan and I looked at this just before this broadcast, um, we had maybe 31 students leave us in the last couple of weeks, and those are the students who are leaving us for things like private schooling or homeschooling. You know, I, I think that there are families who are looking to private schools because they believe they won't shut down as readily as the public schools might, for example, or parents have just decided that homeschooling would be the best option for their family because that's what's going to work best. So I imagine that our students will return to us um, after the pandemic has been, you know, I guess there's, you know, a vaccine for the virus or things have been brought back under control. But for now, I think families are just looking at, you know, options. And you are providing this year flu shots, is that correct? Or that's, Sorry, go ahead. No, th that's through the um, Department of Public Health. Okay. I heard from Sean and Casey Morrow that they're going to be doing some kind of flu shot clinic, but the information for that will come through them. And that would be outdoors at, at one of the schools? I think that that is the story, but I, I don't, you should fact check with them. I will. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then I would like to just get an update from our last special town meeting. We've got, um, a couple of big projects that were going on this summer through the pandemic um, at the high school, Elmwood and Hopkins. So just an update on those three projects. Um, that's really your department as well, Susan. So I'll let you speak to the construction projects because I know you monitor them closely. Okay, thank you. So the, mo the modulars will come down to the wire. Um, the, the timing of the modulars would have fallen very well, but once um, any manufacturer had to follow to any type of COVID regulations, it lessened the amount of construction workers that could work within the modular units at the same time. So whereas you would typically flood that with plumbers, electrician, drywall, whatever flooring, all at the same time, you would see only one trade at a time was allowed to get in there. Um, so the modulars are a little bit behind. Delaying the opening of school has certainly worked in our favor, but the, those two projects will come down to the wire. They will be ready, um, but it, it will be, uh, we'll be getting our certificate of occupancy <laughs> at the last minute. <laughs> yeah. uh, the high school is underway. It really is very newly underway. So there's no reason to believe there's any delays at this point in time. 
Um, the original thought was that we would be in by the Christmas break, but that has long passed. And the, the next thought is really um, uh, February vacation is what the high school is, is planning for. Okay. Yeah, and we have walked through the Elmwood and Hopkins modulars. They look really beautiful on the inside. So I think that, you know, they really are in an advanced stage of construction for sure. Absolutely. That'll be great. Yeah. yeah. And those will be used for classrooms, correct? Yes. So um, at Hopkins, we you know, may have the Kids Bro program in there for full-time care for teachers. Um, and that, that has just sort of evolved because of the number of students who are not in attendance this year at Hopkins. You know, certainly if all of our students were back in, we would fill those modulars readily. Um, and one of the other things that we have found is so in small classrooms where you would have um, typically done, say, you know, a small pullout reading group or you've had counseling with, you know, the school psychologist or something like that, because we would have had maybe three of speech and language, for example, we would have had three or four or five kids in a small space. What we've done now is we've tried to relocate them to some of the larger classrooms. And so some of the teachers who are teaching students that are remote, we've moved some of those teachers into, you know, those smaller rooms that would have used, been used for small groups. So the students, um, certainly on IEPs, that usually get pulled from a classroom for those kind of services, are they still being pulled out of the classroom? Well, just to be clear, you know, the ideal model is to do a push in, right, that we would like to be able to deliver all of our services in the classroom. But in, if, you know, in any student's IEP or, you know, a kid doesn't have an IEP but get re gets reading services or someone gets, you know, speech and language, th they would still be pulled out and there is ample room for that to happen. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the next thing is the HCA stabilization fund or the, the host community agreement. Um, will this, I know this is um, run through the town manager, so we'll be asking uh, him about this as well. Um, will any of that money be used this year in this budget? So our understanding right now is that the answer to that is no. Um, originally we were planning on that and I don't know Susan if you would like to talk any more about that but at this point you know we think that it will just go into our stabilization fund and, and stay there. That's correct. So the funding model once the pandemic hit and um, the economy really turned south the funding model that the town was using and, and again I, this is really more of a discussion with the town manager and, and CFO um, but they really were looking at how to best fund this budget uh, at a reduced level. And at the time, they were thinking with one of the assumptions, if the state revenues were down so low, they would pull from that HCA stabilization. The good news is it looks as though the funding from the state will not be as low as that original assumption. That being said, uh, the state has not passed a budget. Um, but at this time, they're moving forward with not using the HCA money, which is very good news. So it will stay in the stabilization uh, for the school department. Okay, great. Um, and I'm not sure who to uh, give this question to, but the high school diversity club uh, came up with a program that was supposed to be today and is being postponed. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, who's putting it on and um, how people can get involved. Sure, I would love to talk about that. So the, it's, it's been very interesting. Uh, the High School Diversity Club um, is, you know, a group that's really, you know, they've, they've, they've been kind of active within the school. And then there's another group in town called the Hopkinton Freedom Team. So as the Freedom Team was kind of in its infancy, we had reached out to some of the members of the diversity club, kids who had graduated from the high school, um, as well as some of the advisors. And somehow in that venue, we started to talk about a community-wide event. So uh, Freya Proudman, who graduated in 2018, Shazane Khan, who was 2020, he just, re he just graduated this spring, and Mike Finn, Kim Hesse, and Lisa Winner. They are the three people who advise that. And then there's also Sam Breen, Dan Collins. So there's a, a good little core group of, of faculty at the high school. And Lisa Winner had uh, 
seen a, a Chalk About It event and that got Freya, I think, really motivated. So she started to put together flyers and then Kim Hesse contacted Representative Dykema and the police department and the town hall and the fire department and everybody. So the whole notion is that tomorrow afternoon, sometime between noon and four, anyone in the community should be able to go out and do any kind of chalk drawing that promotes diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, or what they call ABAR, anti-bias, anti-racist messaging. Just messages of kindness and empathy and love, whatever it is. Um, the school district has a few drones, and so we'll be able to take photographs using our drones. Um, but if folks in town want to take pictures and then send them to the Hopkinton High School Diversity Club, we would love to have them. And somehow there will be something put together to really, you know, kind of advocate for and illustrate um, the willingness of, in Hopkinton to promote social justice. So we're really excited about it. It's an amazing event that has just come about really organically. That sounds fantastic. Now, will they be able to um, find the information on your website, on the school's uh, website? I believe it's on the school's website. Um, and I think that they should look for the Hopkinton High School Diversity Club. I think that it's also on Facebook. And okay. I know that um, we have pushed out a lot of email as well. OK, uh, we as eHop can also uh, put the link on our website. Right. We can update that. Sure. Uh, but that sounds amazing. Um, so I want to check in with Amanda. Do you think there's anything that we have to discuss further? This very guy, this is the easiest interview I've ever had. <laughs> I think it's great to have uh, our rock stars with us and uh, everything has been well covered. So I think we're good. I just want to take this time to thank you guys so much. Um, I encourage people to watch this video, watch all four. Um, just some reminders about town meeting. Um, you can show up as early as 8.30 in the morning to get checked in. Um, the meeting will start at 9.30 with a quorum of 80 people, that's 8-0. Um, once you're there, get comfortable, because once you're in your seat, they, they would really like you to stay in your seat. Um, uh, besides being able to get up and talk into the mic, uh, or going to use the restroom, they're still figuring out the restroom situation, but um, you're really gonna be in your seats. And this is the first town meeting where you can bring snacks. So that's encouraging. Um, and the meeting will continue until all articles are voted on. Um, so educate yourself ahead of time. Uh, reach out to the town officials with your questions. Uh, again, thank you guys for joining this segment of EHOP's Know Your Vote. And thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh and Susan Rothmick and Amanda Fargiano uh, for your valuable time. And as always, thank you to HCAM for your constant support and partnership with EHOP in producing this show. Uh, we do have three other segments. We met with um, the town clerk and the town moderator this morning. We're also meeting with the select board, town manager, planning board, CPC. Um, so there's a lot of information, but we're hoping to, to tighten it up and get it out there in short segments. Um, so this is a great way to educate yourself on the articles and allows you to reach out to the proper resources. We will see you all on September 12th at the high school. Again, check-in starts at 8.30 and the meeting starts at 9.30. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for all the work you do. Thank you.